Hello everybody, I'm going to talk about chapter 9. We are in the Byzantine world. Um, we're still in the, uh, the split of the Roman Empire, east and west, and the east is Orthodox Greek, um, and uh, now this will become um, a Byzantine place, still with the capital at Constantinople, here on the right, uh, but still spreading into Italy, um, in particular Ravenna. So Justinian is the emperor of this uh, new place, and he establishes a new law code where um, the will of the emperor is law. He does away with old Roman consuls and senate, and he declares himself to be um, the law of the land. And we've seen that again in other uh, cultures as well. Uh, he reconquers Italy. Uh, they are Greek Orthodox, but they consider themselves to be Roman, Romanoi. Um, remember, um, Constantinople uh, had before Byzant before it was Can Constantinople, it was um, Byzantium, which was a, uh, a Greek city. So they are Greek Orthodox now. Uh, and Justinian makes a lot of land reforms, which really are the beginning of feudalism. Uh, if you uh, think about like serfs and lords and that system, this begins um, with Justinian. This is the Barberini ivory, and it shows Justinian as the world conqueror. So we've, we've seen this before with the Romans with their equestrian sculptures, showing their glory and might through conquest. But of course here he has a little bit of a... Um, like a holy twist to it. He goes with God. Um, he calls the Byzantium the new Rome. And here we see Orthodox Christians using Roman imagery, such as the equestrian statue. Justinian builds this massive, beautiful church called the Holy Wisdom or Hagia Sophia in Greek. It is in Constantinople. And um, of course, it's been rebuilt as a mosque, not rebuilt, built onto as a mosque. So we have these minarets we'll know in chapter 10, the next chapter about the minarets. Um, and he rebuilt the palace church. So this is a very impressive building. It's a central plan church. So everything radiates out of the center. The dome is on top of a square though. It's not um, the dome like, the Romans used in the Pantheon. This is a dome that's put on top of a square, which is a very stable thing to start with. So if you have a square and you want to make a dome on top of it, you have two choices. One is to just make the dome right on the square and you'll have leftover corners. And this we call a squinch. But Hagia Sophia has this. If you um, take these corners and um, uh, raise them, and uh, bring the dome down, they will form more like a vault inside, and that is a pendative. And that is what the Hagia Sophia has. So Hagia Sophia has these giant, massive piers. These are these things that buttress against it and hold up the weight, but they're pretty clumsy. We're gonna see this change in Romanesque and Gothic architecture. So from the outside, it looks really massive and dark and solid. And these things can't be seen on the inside. So when you get on the inside, it's not this clumsy, thick masonry. It's this light, airy, open space where a viewer will go in and be surrounded by all this light cascading down on them and what this would have felt like to a visitor. You know, see the scale here. People aren't used to going into places that are so grand and gigantic all around them. So this might have even caused some, you know, feelings of spirituality or getting, you know, the light of God in you or something like that. And this is on purpose, this kind of architecture, to create a religious environment, but a feeling to inspire people. So when you look straight up at the dome, it looks like the heavens shining back down on you. 
And so again, this is a moss, so we have all kinds of extra stuff. We don't have the, the cross on the apse. This is a mosaic from the Hagia Sophia. And this is Christ between Constantine Monomachus and Empress Zoe. Uh, Constantine, not the Constantine, a much later Constantine, uh, um, was married to Empress Zoe, and he was, this guy is the uh, third husband. She was married three times and adopted a son. Uh, she could not get married until her, um, her father was dying, and then she promptly married three different gentlemen, successfully, uh, successively, I should say, and um, she uh, is a powerful figure. She rules herself for a little bit of time because her, her adopted son was too young to rule at the time he took power. But it's said that she was obviously responsible for having four men put on the throne. Um, we see here her husband bringing a bag of money as an offering. Right? And uh, Christ sits enthroned with his sign of the blessing. That's what that hand sign is. You'll see that in many works of art soon to come. Uh, Justinian built, he had built the church called San Vitale in Ravenna. Um, and by that, I mean, he had it built. Uh, it said that neither he nor his wife um, ever went to Ravenna. He just had building projects all over the place. So here you see the central plan. We have these um, arms here. We're going to call those buttresses, right? They're pushing in on the weights. And this is a construction style that's going to um, become intricate or integral to um, Gothic art. So there's the central plan, everything radiating out of the center. So here you go in the, the church and you will go around it, right? You move around it circularly. And you can see it's covered with mosaics, many, many mosaics. And mosaics are tiny little pieces of glass that are glued next to each other. And some of these are goldish, so they reflect the candlelight kind of flickering back at you when you look up at them. This is the um, mosaic that is in the apse of San Vitale. And it is Christ uh, on the orb, the holy orb, the universe. And he sits in his purple robe, which is a color that was reserved for um, royalty, like the king or the um, emperor. So we see Christ wearing the, the purple of the king. And he sits enthroned and he is giving um, a wreath to um, St. Vitalis himself. And on the right, we have the bishop um, presenting a model of the church, San Vitale, to Christ. So it's all built for him. It's being offered for Christ. And we have this gold background. I'm going to point that out. That's sort of the color of uh, Byzantine. So if you see gold and a lot of gold being used, you'll know that it's uh, Byzantine art. And the gold is to indicate that this is a heavenly spiritual um, place that they are in. It is not supposed to be realistic or earthly. It's flat. And in the same church, uh, right down below Christ to the left is Justinian himself, a portrait uh, of uh, the ruler who had never even gone to Ravenna, but it's there to remind people in the out outlying parts of his empire of his existence. And so here he is in his purple purple robe, and he is bringing a bowl that would have the Eucharist in it to celebrate the Mass of Christ. The Eucharist is um, a symbol, which would be the little um, wafers or bread that you're given at Mass to symbolize the body of Christ. So here he is in attendance to um, to Christ, and there's his his bishop stands next to him. And they are in a gold background. So they are sort of flattened figures. You see, there's no Greek contrapposto or um, any movement or um, desire to show perfect proportions. The feet sort of just overlapped strangely, standing on each other. It's, a, it's about 
what they're doing and who they're doing it for, not about where they are in realistic space. So Justinian the bishop giving bread to Christ. There is a general and the entourage. It's actually the holy army. Justinian wears a halo, which would have indicated royalty. So in a way, Christ wears the halo of an emperor. It is compressed space. And we have this deliberate flattening to show a spiritual world. Across from Justinian is his, a mural of his wife, Theodora and her attendants, and she wears her purple robe. And they seem to be in a space, they actually seem to be in the apse of the church here. And she brings a chalice, which is wine. That is the blood of, symbolic of the blood of Christ. So both Justinian and Theodore are participating in the Eucharist. They are serving uh, um, for Christ. Right? But again, in this flattened place, but the artist has been careful to show Theodore and all of her jewels and luxury. Um, all of their dresses look very, you know, sort of sumptuous and, and um, luxurious. So this isn't about being a humble servant. This is just about being a servant. Well, with all this imagery uh, comes this idea, and uh, a lot of you had great answers for um, on the discussion board about iconoclasm, um, about vandalism or iconoclasm. And um, people were very upset that all of these uh, images are everywhere, and not just in churches. Icons themselves, it's the Greek word for image. It, it, these are mostly portable little paintings, and there's many examples in the textbook of these. Um, that were painted to actually be prayed to, not be prayed by. Like say, at, if you're at church, there's murals everywhere, but you wouldn't go to the mural and pray to whatever's in the mural. Um, but some churches certainly were considered to be um, icons or idol uh, idolatry, which just means idols. Um, and there was a great uprise against this and the... Uh, the smashing and burning and taking of icons because of the second commandment, which says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth below. Um, thou shalt not bow down thy, thyself to them nor serve them. This is this is a split between uh, um, Jewish, the Jewish faith only follows the um, Old Testament. And this, of course, is a commandment that is in the, the uh, Old Testament. So uh, very early on, um, Jewish people do away with having imagery like this to, um, to stop the confusion of images versus religion. Um, and so there was this big uh, uh, iconoclastic uh, battle uh, which Justinian was not for. He believed in having art in churches and, and he was okay with icons. So he continued his program. In fact, he saved many from um, different churches, one being St. Catherine's. And this is the one that's in St. Catherine's. This is Christ's blessing. And here we have Christ in the pose of a blessing. That's the hands with the two fingers touching the thumb. And this is an odd painting. This is supposed to be on the right side, um, Christ's human part or half, and the other side is his holy half. So the dual role of Christ on earth. This is uh, a later Byzantine church. It's in it's San, Mar San Marco or St. Mark's in Venice. And this is late Byzantine, but again, all this gold would make you think that it was Byzantine. It is a central plan church. It has been worked on many times over, so uh, not all of it is uh, from this time period. But many of its rich artifacts and relics were plundered from Constantinople, um, including many artifacts that were taken from Hagia Sophia, so the church we just saw. 
and uh, the architecture itself was probably influenced by another church that was in Constantinople. So this is even more far reaching in, into Italy. Uh, Venice is, is uh, way up north from Ravenna. So we have the spread of Byzantine to other parts of Italy. And as you read in the book, over to Russia, this is the end of the, the chapter, uh, goes on about um, the Russian influence. And uh, the Russians are, the Russian, Russian Byzantine um, worshipers are totally okay with icons. As a matter of fact, uh, there's still a lot of icons around there. Um, and icon painting flourished at this time in Russia. And this man, Andrei Rubilev, was a very, very successful icon painter. Um, there is a movie on Netflix about him, if you get a chance to watch it, it's pretty interesting. Um, but here you have these three humble angels um, looking very um, somber and devout. So somebody would come in probably with some grief or sorrow and pray to these angels for comfort. So that, that's kind of the difference. Like you would go and actually pray to the icon itself. And we'll see this, uh, well, we won't see it in our class, but if you take Art 115 survey, um, we cover the Baroque art where there is the Protestant Reformation. This is very, very similar. This will happen all over again in history where um, religions will split uh, in their difference about what to do about um, all the images and art that that is in um, churches. All right, so that's it for this chapter. Um, it's a short one, and the next chapter is also going to be a very short one, so I'll post this and um, to be continued. Thank you.